Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. I thought this time I'd make you guys wait a little bit, so. <laughs> so I came late. It wasn't intentional, though, actually. Um, well, let's open with prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the book of Acts. We thank you as we watch the journeys of the Word, the Word of God, um, beginning in Jerusalem and spread to the ends of the earth. And we thank you that that Word came to us and that we are able to study it and find life in the Word, the life of Christ in our life, our life eternal. Please bless this time of, of uh, study, Lord, this lecture, that it may be to your glory and for the good of your people. In the name of Jesus, we ask it. Amen. Amen. So chapter 28, um, we're on Malta, the island of Malta, after the shipwreck. Um, once safely on shore, we found out that the island was called Malta, um, which is a part of the Roman province of Sicily, by the way. Uh, it's about 60 miles south of Sicily, uh, about 500 miles west from where the storm hit them, roughly. So they, they've traveled quite a ways in that storm. Uh, the islanders, it sounds like you're in Hawaii or something, but uh, the, this is the NIV's translation, islanders. The uh, English Standard Version uses the word native people. Um, but the word in Greek is actually barbarian. It's, it has, it's, it's barbaro boy, whatever. But anyway, it's just the word barbarian, if you put it into English, meaning non-Greek speakers. Okay, so, you know, for, for the cultured people, uh, if you didn't speak Greek, you're barbarians. You know, you're kind of like not, not very classy, but, but as we see, they're very kind people. Um, the, the islanders showed us unusual kindness, which is, again, a theme of, of Luke. He shows us these people who are uh, pagans, and yet, like Julius the centurion and others that are just, they show unusual acts of kindness, including a little bit later, uh, Publius, the, uh, the leader on the island. Um, they built a fire, this is the islanders, they built a fire and, <clears throat> and welcomed us all because it was raining and cold. So they're being, they, they greeted them as they came ashore. They saw the shipwreck, you know, stuck on the bar. They saw people swimming ashore and coming ashore on, the, um, on, on, beam, on parts of the ship. And uh, so they welcomed them, they built a fire to keep them warm. And Paul gathered a pile of brushwood, wood, which shows us his character. You know, a, a character who wants to serve rather than be served. Um, in fact, the application here is that, that we each have unique gifts and abilities. We all have gifts and abilities. God gave every one of us as his people specific spiritual gifts. But regardless of those gifts, we are called to lend a hand whenever we can in the work of the body of Christ. So Paul didn't go, gathering firewood? That's not my thing. I am a preacher of the word. You know, it's like, no, he, he pitched in. He goes and he gathers up firewood and, and brings it up there, some brushwood. And as he put it on the fire, a viper, and this is a poisonous snake there on the island, and the people, they know it's a poisonous snake because what they say next, a viper driven out by the heat fastened itself on his hand. When the islanders, oh, they got it on his, on his wrist in the photograph there, but I just wondered, on, the, on your handout, um, on his hand. And when the islanders saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to each other, this man must be a murderer, for though he escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. And that's kind of an ancient way of looking at things. Um, that that you, if something bad happens to someone, they must have done something bad themselves. They're getting punished by that. That's fate. Um, remember when the disciples came to Jesus and asked him, whose sin was it that caused the Tower of Siloam to fall on those people and kill them? Was it their sins that caused the tower to fall? Was it their, uh, the sins of their, parent, their fathers before them? You know, there's something, when something bad happens, People say, well, somebody that was caused by someone doing something bad. Um, that's not the biblical view, though. That's not what happens. In fact, bad things happen to, quote, good people as well. You know, Christians suffer because it's a broken world. And in spite of the suffering, in spite of the bad things, like the shipwreck and all those things, here's Paul. It's like he, all these bad things happen to him, but God is still at work in it. 
And God still works through those opportunities, even in the midst of bad. God can bring all things together for good, and he does do that. By the way, uh, at least in the translations I looked at, the, the word justice is capitalized. And you go, what? Why was that? Because for the, there was a Greek, in the Greek Roman world, justice was a goddess. And so it, it looks like perhaps if they're saying, they're talking about, you know, the goddess justice sent this snake because this guy must be a murderer. They knew he was a prisoner, but they thought he must be a murderer because now the, the goddess justice sent this snake to bite him and kill him and not let him, even though he survived the shipwreck, he's going to die because he must be a bad guy. But Paul shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no ill effects. The people expected him to swell up or suddenly fall dead. But after waiting a long time and seeing nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and said he was a god. Now that happened before. Remember one time when, when uh, uh, Paul, uh, healed, Paul and Silas, they healed someone and they said, or Paul and Barnabas, and they said, you must be gods. You know, and they tried to worship them. In this case, they don't try to worship him. They just say, whoa, he must be a god, you know, that he could be bitten by a poisonous snake and not die. Um, there was an estate nearby that belonged to Publius, the chief official of the island. He welcomed us to his home. Now, the us there isn't clear. Um, possibly all 276 survivor, survivors of the shipwreck perhaps, or it might mean just kind of the leaders and those who were kind of that inner circle, which included, you know, uh, Jul uh, Julius and the, the ship owner and Paul and his companions who had kind of gotten in the inner circle. So perhaps it's that group, but we don't know. It just says us. Uh, at least Luke and Paul were part of that. To his home and for three days in entertained us hospitably. His father was sick in bed, suffering from fever and dysentery. Paul went in to see him, and after prayer, placed his hands on him and healed him. So we see kindness. We had the kindness of the people building the fire on the beach. We see the kindness of Publius, the leader of the island, who invites him into his own, his own uh, state. Uh, and then we see the kindness of God at work. When, when Paul then heals this father of Publius, um, God's kindness at work. Uh, verse 9, when this had happened, the rest of the sick on the island came and were cured. And it's interesting, the word there for were cured, in the Greek, it's a, it's a variation of the word therapeutic. That's where we get the word therapeutic, is from the Greek word that's used here about being cured. And so the therapeutic, uh, you know, uh, remedies for healing or, or pathways to healing, that's what therapeutic medicine is. Uh, they honored us in many ways, and when we were ready to sail, they furnished us with the supplies we needed. Wow, what nice people, <laughs> you know? How, how wonderful. Um, now, after verses 11 and following, after three months, we put out to sea in a ship that had wintered in the island. So there was a ship that had gotten there, had waited out the winter time. Now, they probably... The shipwreck probably took place late October, early November. Remember, it was at the end of the season. Um, and, uh, but the sailing season, I talked before about it, ended like November and, and October 10th and began uh, March 10th, something in that range. An ancient historian, Greek historian Pliny, he talks about the, the earliest season date, February 7th, which actually kind of fits here. Because um, if you, they shipwrecked around October, late October, early November, December, January, February, that's three months. So it kind of fits that it was a, they're, they're taking the earliest they can and they're saying, oh, weather's good. It's the time we can get going in this early part of the season. Um, it was an Alexandrian ship, which is what they were on last time. Remember the grain ship, big old grain ship that had some troubles? Well, now they got on another Alexandrian ship with the figurehead of the twin gods, Castor and Pollux. Um, those were the guardian deities for sailors. That's who they kind of like, um, you know, there are all the saints that people have, like um, a, a Saint, um, uh, uh, oh, never mind. <laughs> I'll, I'll blow it here. You know, saint Nicholas is the patron saint of children and of barbers and, and other things too, you know, where um, each, each, there's different groups that have different 
saints, um, so to speak. It was kind of like that for the gods and goddesses. You had your, 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 uh, your guardian deities kind of thing. Um, but it could also be kind of a jab at their uselessness, because look what they went through. I mean, how, how good are these gods at protecting them from the, the storms and so forth? Okay, um, verses 12 and following. We put in at Syracuse and stayed there three days. From there, we set sail and arrived at Regium. The next day, the south wind came up, and on the following day, we reached Petulia. Pet, pet, put, uh, um, Victor, Vic, uh, Victor, <laughs> is it Putioli, 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 there it is, okay, um, Syracuse, I know Syracuse, because that's in New York, but, um, so they stayed, they, basically, they, they sailed about 80 miles from Malta to Syracuse, and then from there, um, another 70 miles along the island of Sicily, till they got to Regium, on, on the toe of, of uh, Italy, and then they went to Putioli, which is the capital, I mean, the uh, harbor, the main harbor for Rome. There was a natural harbor closer to Rome a bit, but this was the one that could take the big ships. And so um, this was Rome's main harbor. Um, and so that, and it's about 70 miles from Rome, so a bit of a journey. There we found some brothers, believers, fellow believers, who invited us to spend a week with them. Imagine that, here's a prisoner, and he's allowed to spend a week with you know, fellow believers, with friends. Um, uh, let's see, um, it, and that speaks to the relationship of Paul and the centurion Julius. You know, they've been through a lot, and Julius had learned a lot about Paul and his character, and about Julius' character as well, we learned about him. And so we came to Rome, um, all the way back to to uh, chapter one of Acts, and Jesus is talking about how you will be my witnesses, you know, beginning in Jerusalem, to Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And here they are at Rome, you know, that's, whoa, the journeys, we're at the end of this story for now. The, the brothers there had heard that we were coming, and they traveled as far as the form of Appius and the three taverns to meet us. So the, the Greek word here is an official delegation. In other words, people, they, they specifically came out there representing the Christians in Rome to greet them officially. Uh, and this is on the Appian Way, which is a very famous uh, Roman road. Uh, the form of Appius is about 40 miles outside of Rome. And then another 10 miles along were the three taverns, which was about 30 miles um, from Rome. At the sight of these men, Paul thanked God and was encouraged. When we got to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. Um, so he's under house arrest, but with a guard, but free to have visitors. Amazing, amazing. And just an application at this point that even bold Paul, you know, Paul, that solid missionary, you know, that, that preacher of the gospel who had faced death over and over and over again, he was blessed by the presence and encouragement of fellow believers. You know, the great Paul is greeted by fellow believers and it encourages him. And that's a reminder to us that our presence and our support of one another in God's family is crucial. I mean, if Paul needed it, how much more do we all need that encouragement and that support as well? Okay, chapter 28, verses 17. In Rome, Paul's ministry as a prisoner. If you recall back in chapter 23 of Acts, um, when Paul was in prison in Caesarea, or in Jerusalem actually at the start, but anyways, in, uh, um, Paul had a vision from Jesus. And, and Jesus said, Paul, you're gonna testify in Rome. Jesus himself told Paul that. So Paul knew he's going to Rome. He's gonna make it to Rome to testify. And here they are. He's able to testify in Rome. And what does he do? He does what he normally does when he's on his missionary journeys, even though he's, in, he's under house arrest, but he's still on a missionary journey. And it, first to the Jews, then to the Gentiles. And um, it, under Claudius in the year 49, um, he had an edict that expelled the Jews from Rome. But now we're in around the year 61, 62, around 61 to, um, and at this time, that's no longer in effect. And so Jews are allowed to have a community again in Rome, 
And so Paul then calls together the leaders of the Jews. And when they had assembled, Paul said to them, my brothers, now this is brothers meaning fellow Jews, not fellow believers, because these are not believers. These are Jewish leaders. Um, but my brothers, as a fellow Jew, although I have done nothing against our people or against the customs of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. They examined me and wanted to release me because I was not guilty of any crime observing death. Remember the first tribune who brought Paul from Jerusalem under guard with, with protective guard, uh, soldiers because they wanted to assassinate him, brought him to Caesarea, and he said he wrote to the governor, uh, Felix, and said, I, I see nothing, nothing wrong in this man. And then Felix handing over to Festus, I see nothing wrong with this man. And Festus with Agrippa talking, I see nothing wrong with this man. Agrippa, I see nothing wrong. This guy's done, done nothing. And, and then, but because the leaders wanted to try to still kill him, Paul appeals to Rome. But it was clear he had done nothing deserving any punishment. Um, but when the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar. Not that I had any charge uh, to bring against my own people. For this reason, I've asked to, at, to see you and talk with you. It is because of the hope of Israel that I am bound with this chain. Okay, well, the hope of Israel, that's the promise of the Messiah. Okay, that's what the Jews were looking for. The, the Messiah, the one that's going to come and rescue them and, and, and you know, make a great kingdom again. And it's because of that hope of the Messiah, the gospel. And he's going to have an opportunity shortly to, to, to uh, share that gospel, that hope of, the, of, of Israel with them. It's because of that that I am bound with this chain. And that's the chain, it's a reminder that even though he's under house arrest, he is arrested. You know, he's there, he's got a guard, and he has a chain. Uh, verse 21, they replied, we have not received any letters from, Jer to, from Judea concerning you, and none of the brothers who have come from there have reported or said anything bad about you. But we want to hear what your, what your views are, for we know that people everywhere are talking against this sect. So it's interesting because before, when Paul went out into the, um, in his first missionary journeys, he would go to synagogues where they knew nothing about any of this stuff most of the time. And then they, he would just tell them. And they go, what? In this case, they're saying, hey, we want to know more about this. We want to know what you're teaching. You know, there's an interest there, which is kind of a, a different, different thing from what he's had before. Uh, verse 23, they arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and come and, eat, and came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. So think about this. Large numbers of people come to him before he had to go out and find them and go out and go to them, you know, going and traveling all over. Now they're coming to him in his house arrest. You know, this is amazing. Um, <clears throat> From morning till evening, he explained and declared to them the kingdom of God and tried to convince them about Jesus. Okay, that's what it's all about, about Jesus, you know, the hope of Israel. That's Jesus from the law of Moses and from the prophets. In other words, the Hebrew Bible, the law and the prophets. That's the Hebrew Bible. So he's from scripture, he's showing them the hope of Israel is Jesus. He's the fulfillment of the promise in the Messiah. Some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. They disagreed among themselves and began to leave after Paul had made this final statement. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your forefathers when he said through Isaiah, the prophet, okay, the Holy Spirit through Isaiah, not Isaiah saying this, but through Isaiah, the Holy Spirit speaking. And then he quotes from Isaiah chapter six. Go to this people and say, you will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes, Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. Um, in other words, it's a call to repentance, a call for those who aren't believing to repent, to listen, to hear. And this is, this is the story of the Old Testament, in a sense. You know, just as it happened before on the journeys, you know, some would listen, some would believe, but others would reject. You know, God's people God's people, Israel, they would reject God and the Messiah. And, and it's the story of the Old Testament over and over again. God's people rejecting God, rejecting his way, 
and so forth. It's a call to repentance. Jesus himself quotes that same passage of Isaiah in Matthew 13 when they ask him, why do you teach in parables? And he quoted from Isaiah right there. So verse 28, therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles and they will listen. For two whole years, Paul stayed there on, in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. Two years, two years he gets to keep preaching and teaching and, and encouraging and so forth. Boldly and without hindrance. You know, he's, 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 in a, he's able to be safe and legal. Um, nobody's throwing him out in the street trying to, to stone him or like the, the happened before and all those different things. He's able to promote the gospel. Um, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. And while he's there during those two years of captivity, we know he wrote Philippians. He wrote the letter to the Colossians. He wrote to Philemon and possibly even Ephesians when he was there, possibly. Um, so just, a, just an application here. And then a few, a few more thoughts, and then we're going to have a, a prayer. Um, but... Um, it's easy to become so self-centered that we give no thought to sharing Christ and his love with others, especially in times of personal turmoil. If we're going through some difficulties in our life, you know, maybe it's a medical thing, maybe a financial thing, maybe um, some other, you know, a family issue, things like that. We kind of just, we clamp onto that one thing and we become so self-centered and we kind of just like get focused on that and, and then we miss any opportunities that God brings our way to witness and to share God's love. Sometimes that happens to us in our sin. Look at Paul, you know, he, all this stuff that's happened to him. And he's in jail. He's not in jail, but he's in prison. He's, he's in prison. He's under house arrest. And yet he, he shares, the, he shows us the way of joy and peace that comes in sharing the love of Christ in any and every situation of life. So, so what next? This is where it ends. What next? What next? Luke doesn't tell us anymore. Well, we have evidence in other places where Paul wrote some things, and we have also evidence from other sources, of ancient history sources, but it's, it seems like eventually he was acquitted. He writes um, to second, in 2 Timothy, I was, I was uh, delivered from the lion's mouth. Okay, and it's thought that he's talking about his, his being in prison, that he was acquitted which would make sense because he hadn't done anything wrong. There's no way they could, what would they get to charge him with? Um, later on, we read in Titus, where he it seems he worked on Crete and installed Titus there. He had been on Crete and worked there and then had Titus was installed as the pastor there. Uh, he, re, he revisited Miletus, we read in 2 Timothy. Uh, Troas, we read in 2 Timothy. These were all written at the end of his life, near the end of his life. And Macedonia, also in First, in first Timothy, we read about that. Um, perhaps he went to Spain. We don't know that. There's no, no, no record of it. But he did express his desire in Romans. He told the, in his letter to the Romans, he expressed his desire to go to Spain and bring the gospel there. Um, we know of a second imprisonment in Rome. We read about it in Second Timothy. He's expecting execution. In fact, this is what he writes. This, and this is very different from his first imprisonment in Rome. But he writes to Timothy, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. <laughs> I have finished the race. I'm sorry, I'm getting emotional all the time now. <laughs> I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now... Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. I'm sorry. <laughs> Anyways, um, finally, ancient sources say he was beheaded in Rome in the, about the year AD 66. Oh. Are you dealing like the rest of us? <laughs> Oh, I, you know, I wrote that out not even thinking about it, you know, just like, you know, he's ready to depart. And I, here I am getting ready to depart as pastor. 
Anyways, uh, okay. Well, we get to go have fellowship and potluck time. <laughs> Some happy time, but we're gonna pray first. And, um, and, uh, and we're gonna have, a, in our prayer, I'll include the meal prayer, which means when we're done, you can just go and go right to the tables to eat. I mean, go right to the food. And um, as, as someone, who was it that once said, I was at the seminary, um, I learned a new word. And the word is a single word. It was this, squeet. <laughs> so at the, at the end of the, after the prayer, squeet. Okay? So let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the blessing of your word to us. Thank you for the Apostle Paul and for all the missionaries and the disciples and apostles and all the Christians that we see in the book of Acts. And thank you that by your grace we are numbered among that family of God. Lord, be with us as we go forth. Strengthen us in our faith. Continue to, to help us be Bible students and, and learners uh, our whole lives through, to grow in our faith through your blessing, through your Holy Spirit. And Lord, please bless the food that we are about to eat. Thank you for those who prepared it. Thank you that we have the opportunity to fellowship around that food and bless it to the good of our bodies, to your glory. This we ask in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's go eat.